Vladimir Portin. Part 7. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and we continue our in-depth analysis of Vladimir Putin in order to understand more about what he is. Utilising a diverse range of sources, from both the public and private domains, I have analysed hours' worth of material, identifying certain traits and behaviours to help you understand more about the Russian president. We now turn to the question of his inner circle. Putin might be known as a solitary figure, but at the highest level, he likes to surround himself with loyal aides, grandiosity, assertion of control. So, who does he have in that inner circle of Siloviki, which is known as men of force, or as, as some people have described it, the judocracy, in reference to the president's black belt and his apparent judo cronies. One of the most notorious is Russia's Minister of Defence, Sergei Shogu, age 66, a long-time confidant of Putin, who was behind the military seizure of Crimea in 2014 and was one of the architects of Russia's intervention in Syria. He also headed up the GRU Military Intelligence Agency, which was accused of two notorious nerve agent poisonings, the 2018 attack in Salisbury in the United Kingdom and the near-fatal attack on opposition leader Alexei Navalny in Siberia in 2020. Shogu is clearly an attack dog, and therefore we have the utilisation of a lieutenant. Shogu is said to go on hunting and fishing trips with Putin and has long been touted as his potential successor. According to Russian security expert Andrei Soldatov, Shogu is not only in charge of the military, he's also partly in charge of ideology, and in Russian ideology is mostly about history and he's in control of the narrative. There's that word again, narrative, which you'll have heard by reference to other people and their use of it, the narrative being an alternative word for the assertion of control. Chief of Staff Valery Garezimov, who Putin biographer Mark Galeotti describes as an unsmiling, craggy bruiser, is another key member of Putin's inner circle. Officially known as the Chief of Staff of the Russian Armed Forces, he was behind the Chechen War of 1999 and, more recently, the invasion of Ukraine. He oversaw the drills in Belarus last month, but reports suggest he might have been sidelined since Ukraine, owing to poor morale amongst Russian troops. Other key members of Portin's top team include Nikolai Potrushev, 70, Secretary of Russia's Security Council, who is sometimes described as the country's second most powerful man, Alexander Bortnikov, 70, director of the FSB, and Sergei Ivanov, 69, a close friend and special representative to the president, who famously dismissed the fatal poisoning of FSB defector Alexander Livinenko in 2006, saying, we didn't care what he said and what he wrote on his deathbed. Alongside them is Sergei Nalishkin, 67, director of the Foreign Intelligence Service, a former KGB classmate of Putin's who famously fluffed his lines during a televised session of the National Security Council on the eve of the Ukraine invasion, with Putin telling him to speak plainly. Those of, that you, those of you that will have seen that televised session will have noticed how everybody else presented in a manner <clears throat> whereby... They were very much towing the party line. And the ability to keep these hard men, these disciplined and capable individuals, many of whom may well be disordered individuals themselves, identifies the ability of Vladimir Putin to understand people, to recognize what makes them tick, and to enable him to assert control. The fact that the way that Narishkin was dealt with was almost like a naughty school child being admonished by a teacher. The final key player is the now-sanctioned oligarch Igor Sechin, 61, head of Russia's state oil company Rosneft, 
whose $120 million yacht was seized by French authorities last week. He served as Portin's dirty deputy chief of staff in 2000, and is often described as the president's right-hand man. A leaked U.S. embassy cable referred to him as the Grey Cardinal of the Kremlin. In essence, smacks of an eminence grease. Sanctioned Russian banking chief Boris Rotenberg is also described as having close personal ties to the president, their childhood friends, and used to practice judo together, like many of Portin's closest friends. Galeotti says this is far from a coincidence. Coincidence. Portin applies many of the principles he uses in judo to his style of geopolitics. What does this group tell us? Well, first of all, notice they are all men. No women are involved. And they're all of similar ages to that of Putin and have personal connections to him, which suggests that they've been selected on the basis of loyalty as opposed to necessarily being a meritocracy. This smacks, of course, of the paranoia of an individual to ensure that those around him are fiercely loyal and have been hand-selected on that basis. Furthermore, whilst they have, whilst they may have varying degrees of ability, they certainly wield a tremendous amount of power. And the fact that Portin is unable to keep them on a leash exhibits his need to assert control over them. By surrounding himself with this in effect Praetorian guard, he is asserting control over them, but he's using them by proxy to assert control over the populace and the world more generally. It exhibits paranoia, a need to assert control, the presentation of a facade of superiority. Alongside this sits a degree of self imposed isolation that Portin has engaged in. It's been described by some that he's in effect lost touch with reality because he's been sealed off from all the world. That isn't the case. Portin operates in his own reality, created by the world vision that he has. His perspective, to him, is the right one. Whilst much is still unknown about Portin's living habits, Russian expert, Russia experts suggest he has an increasingly isolated life, only exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Estimates of Putin's wealth vary well, very, very wildly, but go as high as two hundred billion dollars, which would make him one of the five richest people on the planet. Despite this, he reportedly doesn't have a smartphone and hasn't travelled since the pandemic started, even within Russia. This again is demonstrative of paranoia and a need to assert control, but also grandiosity. Why does he need to travel? Everything can come to him. Muhammad doesn't go to the mountain, the mountain comes to him. Experts claim he spent most of the past two years alone, poring over old maps of the Russian Empire and being ferried between the Kremlin and his luxurious palaces in limousines and helicopters. This demonstrates an ability to be on his own for periods of time. It demonstrates that he is something of a loner. It also demonstrates grandiosity and a sense of entitlement. If the allegation that he spent most of the time poring over old maps of the Russian Empire is correct, this also fits with the worldview that he has that the old Russia, the former glories, the Soviet Union must be reinstated. And the fates of that are inextricably linked to him. As I mentioned earlier, he is Russia and Russia is him. Some of you may be familiar with the film Excalibur, wherein King Arthur of legend is described as he is the land and the land is him and when the king is unwell then the land fails and there's pestilence and starvation and when the land flourishes he also flourishes and vice versa there's a symbiotic relationship that he and the land are one and that is the mindset the grandiosity of Vladimir Putin that he regards Russia as inextricably linked to him that he is able to govern its fates, and he is Russia. The theme of isolation continues with pictures of him sitting at the end of long tables, where there, even there was a recent choreographed appearance with his inner circle. He was seen sitting at a significant distance from his advisers. Part of this, of course, may be the desire not to catch COVID, 
and whilst he doesn't fear it, he would be wary of doing so because of its impact upon his ability to function and thus his ability to maintain control. His wife talked earlier about how he would work 16, 17 hour days. That industriousness is born out of his need to assert control, perhaps also to draw fuel in certain circumstances. The necessity of always knowing what's going on, driven by paranoia, but also that overarching need to control individuals. Sitting a significant distance from his advisors also is demonstrative of the fact that he sees himself as set apart. He has no equals. He is above all men. Insiders say he has seen few people outside his inner circle, who are described as yes-men, who are too afraid to challenge him and only share good news. The few people who have been granted an audience with him since the pandemic have reportedly had to isolate for two weeks in a state hospital protected by armed guards before having to pass through a special tunnel of ultraviolet light and disinfectant mist. This again is demonstrative of paranoia and his need to remain well in order to assert control. It's no wonder then that Portin's worldview is becoming ever smaller and darker, only fueling this sense of paranoia. Suggestion has been made that he may even have food tasters who test his meals before he eats them. It's been described that he was happy to use nerve agents in other countries, which are widely suspected to have been ordered by Putin, although he has denied this. Potential assertion of control through poisoning, issuing of denial. Cunningham has stated, I'm sure he's worried about that. Let's not forget he is a dictator. He's reached the end of the process and is going through what happens with most dictators, that losing touch with reality, surrounding themselves with yes-men and becoming very paranoid. That's often the final stage for any dictator, because everyone is your enemy and you can't really trust anybody, which is why he looks after his bodyguards very carefully. Apparently, they're all millionaires. Bribery, assertion of control through the same. It isn't the case that he is reaching the end. His paranoia has always been there, driving him to seek out the prime aims. However, what is being witnessed is the fact that he doesn't need to be with people all of the time, but merely some of the time. And he needs to be able to control them through a variety of ways, but simply regards them as a nuisance. They're, in effect, to do his bidding, but also with regard to the pandemic, potential threats to control with regard to his health, which he takes very seriously. The use of this inner circle shows the range of lieutenants that are utilised, the adherence to loyalty rather than merit, and the close assertion of control over them to enable assertion of control by proxy. The isolating behaviours are demonstrative of paranoia, but also the way of he sees himself set apart, that he's not accountable to having to appear on a daily basis all around Russia, but all of Russia, indeed the world, should look to him. In part eight, we consider the way that Porting deals with his opponents to glean further insight as to who he is. Join me there. <laughs>